Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming to tonight's event, which celebrates the publication of the latest and fattest edition of AA Files, which Richard will hold up. Um, this issue we've focused on the uh, work and influence of Georges Perec, who is one of the most important writers in post-war literature, and a man whose ideas about space and urban inhabitation are very good, um, are having an increasing influence throughout architecture and art. Uh, we hope that tonight's event will reflect the extent to which that influence is spread and we're very pleased to be joined by a number of contributors to AA Files and also the, author, the authors of a series of e-books in the Proboscis series which were inspired by Perrick's work and commissioned by Giles Lane who is chairing tonight's panel. Giles is in the middle. <laughs> Um, the other panellists are Andrew Leake, who's a senior lecturer at UCL and who translated the Peric texts for AA Files and also previously in Omkidor. We're joined by Ian Monk, who's a writer and translator, and just opening a bottle of water, um, who's a member of the Uli Po as well. Enrique Walker, who's um, an architect, a research student at the AA, by Richard Wentworth, who's the uh, master at Ruskin and an artist, and by William Firebrace, who's a writer and teacher at Stuttgart, and by Patrick Keeler, an artist and filmmaker. So I'm gonna hand you over to Giles now, who's gonna get things rolling. Well, I think we're gonna just go straight into um, inviting Ian to start this evening's proceedings. Ian. Well, they've asked me to, first of all, talk a little bit about the ULIPO, what it is, who we are. It's a group that has now existed for 42 years. It was founded by um, Raymond Queneau, a writer, an amateur mathematician, and Francois de Lyonnais, a mathematician and amateur writer, which kind of um, sort of epitomizes what went on in the early days of the Ulipo. It was a, a reaction against the sort of um, wandering style of modern literature at the time, free verse, uh, the new novel. It was a desire to put structure back into writing, but in a way which is not at all dictatorial. Canot had also belonged to the Surrealist group, and he had learned from that experience that um, telling people what to do all the time, as André Breton uh, did, may have uh, interesting effects in terms of art that's produced, but certainly in terms of a group, it doesn't make for something which lasts for very long. <coughs> so um, the Ulipo is an anti-example of a group because we don't tell people what to do, we tell people what they can do if they want. But yeah, you are all perfectly free to go about uh, living your lives not doing what we do. And we will even enjoy what you do as well, even though it doesn't correspond to what we do. Georges Perec is probably, uh, in the UK, the best known member of the group, apart from maybe Italo Calvino. Um, most of you may perhaps not even know that Calvino was a member of the ULIPO. Uh, Georges Perec uh, spent his life finding extraordinary ways of going about writing. No two of, of his books are the same. And the particular project that we're, the AA Files is focused on <laughs> is a project which combines two I would say two of Perec's several uh, preoccupations, one of which is an extremely complicated mathematical procedure for planning what he's going to do. The other is a fascination with things that other people generally don't notice. But Andy Leake is going to talk about that in a little more detail. So we, we are a group who presents 
what can be called constraints, restrictions, I prefer the word procedures. They are ways of going about writing, ways of giving yourself rules to obey. Some people think that that's uh, anti-inspirational. I would say it's the opposite because it actually frees you up given the fact that you have to do certain things. You have to find out what you can say and what you in fact want to say using these restrictions. And the results can often be extremely surprising, as any reader of Perec will know. So I think it's time to go over to Andy Leake now and look at uh, what Perec was doing in his project, which is called Lieu or Places. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me at the back, yeah? Yes, I assume so, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was in the late 1960s that um, Birek uh, conceived this project. And it started off by Birek choosing 12 different places in Paris. Um, these places were not just chosen randomly, they were places that had a particular significance for Birek. Um, places where he'd lived, places where friends of his had lived, where significant things in his life had happened. In other words, places that were, for him, places of memory, places attached in some way to his past. Um, the idea was that he would go to a different one of these places each month, 12 places, so he goes to a different one each month of the year, go to that place and describe, as he put it, simply or flatly um, what he saw there. But it wasn't just a project that was going to last a year, it was going to, this project was going to last 12 years. So each of these places would be visited um, 12 times over the period uh, of this period of 12 years. Also, um, each month he would describe a different place still one of the 12 places, but not the same place that he's been to, uh, would describe this place from memory. So that in each month, he would describe one place in situ and one place from memory. Now, it was important for, for Perec that these two places should be different places. It was also important for him um, that uh, the same pair of places shouldn't be described together in any given... Uh, in say, for example, twice in uh, two different Januaries. Yeah, so he had to spread these places, these pairs of places, across the 12 years, and the 12 months times 12. And he did this by means of the uh, extremely complex mathematical procedure that Ian uh, referred to earlier, which is, in fact, a set of 12 by 12 magic bi-squares that he asked a, an American mathematician uh, to produce for him. At the end of the 12 years, then, he would have had um, 288 texts. Um, these texts, incidentally, I should say, were when he wrote them, he took them home, sealed them in a brown paper envelope with sealing wax, and put them away, wrote the date, the place on them. And at the end of the 12 years, so in December 1980, he was going to open all of these envelopes, take out his 288 texts, and do something with them. Um, we don't know what he was going to do with them because he abandoned the project halfway through. Uh, in 1975, so we have no idea what kind of uh, montage Perec might have invented uh, for presenting these texts. It, it may have been a simple chronological one, it may have been based on place. It, it could have invented all kinds of things. It might have been put texts together that featured ladies carrying pink umbrellas, and it's, it's the, the kind of classifications that Perec was capable of inventing. Um, no sooner had he abandoned the project, however, than he started publishing bits of it. And the four texts that you'll find um, in this edition of AA Files are, in fact, four of the five series of texts that Perec published in his lifetime. These four texts, in fact, the five lots of texts that he published, were, in fact, all real texts. In other words, they were texts produced by going to the place, sitting down, and describing what he saw. They weren't memory texts. The text that he wrote from memory uh, remained sealed in these brown paper envelopes. Now, initially, when, when you, you might, the first question might appeal to you, uh, uh, um, that might cross your mind is why? Why would he want to do this kind of thing? Why would he want to constrain himself when you think about it to be in a certain place at a certain time in any given month for the next 12 years? Um, one of the interesting points about this constraint, I think, is that unlike most Olympian constraints, it doesn't bear on the form of the writing of the composition itself. It actually bears on his person. It's a way of coordinating time and space in such a way that he is constrained to be somewhere at a certain time. 
And in fact, the irksomeness of having to be somewhere at a certain time might have been one of the factors uh, that led Berek to uh, ab abandon the project. I think there are probably others as well. What did he expect to gain from this um, experiment? Well, he said that what he hoped to find at the end of this 12 year, of these 12 years, uh, what he hoped to see when he opened these texts was evidence of a triple aging, the aging of the places, the aging of his writing, and the aging of his memories. Now, given that these were also places of memory, places that were significant to Perec, you can see that the project as it was initially conceived um, was a sort of autobiographical project. The project as it was published, in other words, the, these, these few bits of it that were published, the kind of offcuts of the project, I think pulls the project as a whole away from the autobiography into a different direction. And that direction is towards what Perec called the infraordinary. Now, from the very early, not from the early 1970s onwards, Perec, uh, along with um, Paul Virilio and Jean Duvigneau, had been interested in this notion of the infraordinary. That is to say, um, what happens around us, particularly in the city, what is so banal, so unremarkable, that we simply don't notice it. Okay. It was that which falls below, if you like, the threshold uh, of noticeability, okay. but we never, which nevertheless forms a kind of um, background noise, I think was the word they use, to our everyday lives. Okay. So if you like, the, 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 the uh, texture of our lives which goes unnoticed. Um, what they were interested in, in the city was not the, the monumental aspects of the city. They were interested in precisely that which is most banal, that which is most unnoticeable. And the, the writing method that Berek developed for these, um, these pieces in, in the project place was one of exhaustivity, to simply note down everything that he saw as simply and as flatly as he could. This is the only way he, really, he, could, he could think of capturing, if you like, in words, this kind of background noise that he talks about. You know? So a kind of exhaustive sort of uh, uh, writing technique. The memories, I think, um, come into this project in, in another way. Uh, many of the places that Perec chose um, to go and visit were places that were um, being rapidly uh, renovated uh, at this period. Uh, one of these, for example, was the Place d'Italie, and the whole of that quartier in Paris uh, had been torn apart from the start of the 1960s and rebuilt. There was also the Rue de la Gaieté in Paris, which was near to the site of the New Montparnasse um, station. All of that area uh, was being gutted, the old was being replaced by the new. Um, this is something you can follow through the texts, and this is uh, one value of these texts being presented perhaps not as Behek might have presented them eventually had he finished the project, but in this chronological way, that reading them year on year, you can see uh, um, this, this kind of disappearance in progress, if you like. Okay. Um, that, I think, is probably all. I mean, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be more questions about this and the relation of, of the kind of writing that Behek invented to record the city. Uh, uh, but um, maybe we'll pass on to yeah. somebody else. Well, I think Ian and uh, Andy have both given a very good kind of introduction to both uh, the context of Ulipo and uh, Perek's particular project that's featured in AA Files. What we're now going to do is move on and uh, Ian is going to read some poems and he's going to then be followed by Enrique uh, and then Richard who are both going to talk about their work uh, as they've published it in uh, the AA Files as it relates to Perek then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the e-books and our Species of Spaces series, and that will be followed by uh, William Firebrace, then Patrick Keeler. And then after Patrick's spoken, we're going to show the first 15 minutes of Patrick's film. Which one is it, Patrick? <laughs> Dilapidate, the Dilapidated Dwelling. <laughs> and then we're, going to, then we're going to break through um, a discussion space. So I'll hand back to Ian. Right. Uh, well... One of the most prolific members of the Ulipo is called Jacques Jouet. He's absolutely unknown in the UK, unfortunately. And for the last six years, he's been writing a daily poem. He wants to write 
a finished poem every day. And this has led him to come up with various strategies for going about writing poetry. One of which he calls metro poems. Metro being, of course, uh, the Parisian underground. And the best way to introduce this, um, this source of poetry would be to read the auto-definitional poem, which uh, I've translated as follows. What is a metro poem? From time to time, I write metro poems, this poem being an example. Do you want to know what a metro poem consists of? Let's suppose you do. Here, then, is what a metro poem consists of. A metro poem is a poem composed during a journey in the metro. There are as many lines in a metro poem as there are stations in your journey, minus one. The first line is composed mentally between the first two stations of your journey, counting the station you got on at. It is then written down when the train stops at the second station. The second line is composed mentally between the second and the third stations of your journey. It is then written down when the train stops at the third station, and so on. You must not write anything down when the train is moving. You must not compose when the train has stopped. The poem's last line is written down on the platform of the last station. If your journey necessitates one or more changes of line, the poem will then have two or more stanzas. An unscheduled stop between two stations is always an awkward moment in the writing of a metro poem. So that was the auto-definitional poem. You've got the idea. I'll read one or two more from a series called Measure. Given that metrology, from the Greek metron, is a science of measure, it is in the natural order of terms that the metro should be the measure of my poem, that it should make the thickness of its slices fit my appetite and weigh in its cool scales the leaves of lasagna and millefeuille. I'll provide the source. The weight that the people around me and I lose or put on per second would be gauged and displayed on electronic scales with four decimal places, like the one at Porte de la Villette in the measurable and unmeasurable exhibition, busily weighing a turnip as it shrivels. Here, it is my voice that gauges the poem as it's being spoken along the grid of lines printed on the page, taking up its exact duration. The dream of unmeasurability which lingers potently in the nocturnal corridors of the dreams we grant ourselves and yet is a type of extravagance reminiscent of a customer at a fishmonger's giving his own fishy eye teeth for a place and not a place to stand up in. To abandon stability via the poem then find it still intact in the same stride the same turn of the wheels, the count that allows for the appreciation of motion, the orthogonal meeting of horizontal lines and vertical rhymes on their edges, inspires me to contradict one day or another mere dredges, affecting these poems which whiteness wedges in an extremely unequal fashion against the doubly straight margins of the paper. These were, I think, poems. There are two basic sorts of metro poems. There are poems written during journeys which he has to make in order to, I don't know, go to Ulipo meetings, which we have every month, or go to do his radio show. There are also 
uh, examples of ones where, given the fact that he's got to, um, he's got to write a poem every day, he just gets on the metro anyway, and off he goes. Um, I can't remember where it's gone now. Right, I'm not going anywhere except along the blue line on my notepad. Forget to write down where I've come from. Give up giving up writing. I know that even on the world's loveliest beach, I could still miss taking the metro. And that passers-by who are a herd of people, me included, are as useless to me as I am useful to them, writing lines on paper which look as if they've been mined from underground, extracted from the loads of a vein, becoming a removable chunk. This Metro poem will be read out this evening at Mercur. At the heart of mother is the Metro, given that the Metropole of Metropolitan is the Metropolis, or mother town, if my dictionary is to be believed on the cover of which is a heart, an organ that pumps on and on and, accordingly, sometimes wears itself out. This poem is the fifth and last in a short series. I wonder how the former, I wonder how the latter, I wonder how they both will be received. There we are. Enrique? Yeah. Well, how do I... <laughs> I was asked to, to talk about the, the work I'm doing at the moment. I'm, as Mark said, uh, finishing a research at the AA on the project Lieu by Perec. And at the same time, I'm starting a, a unit teaching at the university in Chile. Um, I'm not going to talk about the research, but about the, the program of the unit I'm, I'm running at the moment. Um, it's, uh, the unit I proposed is based on an investigation of the of the, of the urban condition of Santiago, the capital of Chile. And uh, it's an investigation that is, has a debt with the work of Perec in two, in two main territories. So basically the, the unit is based in two trajectories. Um, the first trajectory, I would say, is uh, an investigation of the city through the recollection, gathering, uh, documentation, recording of urban data uh, urban data which would be like, it could be named as uh, the ordinary, the infraordinary, the banal, quotidian, that which remains unnoticed, the background noise as, as Perec says, uh, the recollection or documentation of all kind of uh, information that uh, is in the beginning useless, but might turn to be symptomatic of something and therefore be uh, a useful piece of, of data. Um, how do stray dogs move in the city? Santiago has stray dogs, which is interesting. Where are the clocks placed in the city? Uh, what do the writings uh, of the wall say? Where do people uh, sell goods on the streets? Um, what kind of postcards does the city produce? And so on and so forth. Uh, I would say it's, uh, as I said, useless information in the beginning, which might turn to be useful. And I usually refer to a, a fragment of a film I guess everybody knows, which is the, the film Blow Up by Antonioni. There's uh, the, a photographer who goes to Marion Park and takes a series of pictures, Vanessa Redgrave being the, the protagonist. Uh, it's basic pictures which turn out to be a crime, let's say a symptom, only and only at the moment of, uh, of the picture being enlarged at the laboratory. <laughs> meaning through that, that the, the piece of information is taken as, a, as, as basically trivia, which might turn to be symptomatic. The, the second trajectory of the, of the studio is based on uh, what could be termed uh, the notion of potential architecture. ULIPO stands for uh, Workshop of for Potential uh, Literature, and one of the founders, François Lelionnet, uh, had the, the, the project of actually providing all kind of uh, potential disciplines, the U Expo, X standing for cinema, literature, uh, um, detective stories, detective stories uh, 
um, comic books, books uh, cinema, and so on and so forth. Mathematics, mathematics, history, yeah. music, pornography. I guess there's pornography. Pornography. Porn yeah. Uh, Plenty of potential in pornography. <laughs> so the, the there was actually a meeting last year uh, of 15 architects and five uh, Olympians at the French Institute of Architecture, and I was invited to join to try to. Uh, speculate on the possibility of a potential architecture, ou archipo. Um, the second tragedy then of the, of the studio I, I run is based on, the, on, on an exploration of what potential architecture could be, which means to uh, produce architecture under constraints. Uh, naturally, architecture is always produced under constraints as opposed to literature, let's say, or, more, or harder constraints. I, <laughs> Um, but actually the, the exploration is focused on what, what could be termed self-imposed constraints. Uh, constraints which are deliberately imposed by the, the architect in order to enhance uh, a potential search in architecture. Um, the, one of the important uh, conditions for that exploration is based on the total division between uh, the, the, the territory of the constraint and the, produ the produced object. Perec, or I don't actually know whether it was Perec or Harry Matthews, used, speaks about the, the notion of the scaffolding uh, in terms of the, when, when referring to the Ulipo. The scaffolding is a structure which is autonomous, uh, is, gives the possibility of building a house, but then when it's removed, it doesn't leave any trace on the house. Um, in that sense, the, uh, the exploration of potential architecture would be based, uh, rather than on looking for new constraints, on trying to purify the constraints of architecture from uh, the notion of rationality and, and meaningfulness. Uh, if I try to put an example, uh, which is slightly ridiculous though, uh, you might know the, the project by Terrani, the Danteum. Uh, Terrani based the, the, the design of the Danteum upon a very heavy constraint, which was actually all the, the numbers uh, and the structure of the Divina Commedia. Um, the project here would be actually not to try to look for constraints which would, uh, which would, which the object would embody, but rather constraints that would actually give birth to the body, so it's to the project, sorry. Uh, it would be rather to build a, a Danteum upon Boccaccio or Lewis Carroll or whatever, which doesn't actually refer as a structure to the finished object. Richard? Um, <clears throat> I thought I might try and talk about terror um, in the sense of um, being expected to do something or say something or um, try to be good as an artist and um, well I'll take a risk. It, <coughs> something's happened while I've been sitting here which I think I'm the only person who can see it. Uh, which is, of course, the accident of when I came in, I thought that there was a right place to sit because we're like that. And uh, nobody really showed me where to go, so I sat next to the person I feel easiest with, which is Patrick. And, um, well, you can all see the geometry of that, and everybody else has got a geometry of their own, and they all of you have got a narrative about why you are where you are in this space. And some of you are late at the back, and I know how uncomfortable that is. But I'm here, and I'm sitting slightly on the skew, and there's a blind, which is, what is that? It's about a quarter open, that blind. And for the entire time I've sat here, there's been a free theatre on the street. And it's the kind of theatre, I suspect there might be two or three other people who've been watching this. It's just going away. Um, the theatre is the kind of theatre that um, I associate with, well, where I live, for instance, which is really a suburb, which is round the back of King's Cross. Um, I don't associate it with this piece of London, because I know that this piece of London has, was once a suburb also, but has other meanings. And what this was, was I could see a very low roof of 
what I'm sure to somebody is a desirable vehicle, but I don't know anything about cars at all. So I could see this shape, and it, all I could tell you is that it had a sunroof and it was slightly open. Funnily enough, it's been replaced by another one. And uh, around this roof were young men. Can one say d'un certain âge? Uh, perhaps one can't, but a certain kind of youngness and it became clear very quickly that they were in some kind of near homosexual game with each other which uh, was played out around this car. This has been going on ever since I sat down and by little bits of body movement I could see that car doors would open, people would get in, but I could only see pieces of body and I'm too shy to have stood up. Of course, I'm immensely curious to know what's really been happening. And then the roof would move forwards and backwards a little bit, and then doors would open and shut, and people would get out, and other boys would appear. So I'm sure there are people here who can place this maybe near to where they live. Um, and of course, I didn't fix this. Um, and maybe I know almost nothing about Perek. I feel as if coming here this evening is I'm the, the classic fraud. Uh, I think, why was I asked and uh, how can I hold my head up and be true to the project? And there are people who are unquestionably authentic and uh, fantastically pleasurable to listen to. But then you realise that in fact, of course, we're all in the same space. You don't... Uh, in a funny sort of way, none of, you don't choose your moment. Uh, you get born. Uh, you, it's not something you organise, and that takes place somewhere at some time. And I realised that, in fact, my uh, student period ran absolutely parallel to this, probably to the flowering of this. So I was a student from 1965 to 1970, and one of my primary fascinations was lived in a street called Chatham Street, which is off the New Kent Road near the Elephant. And I watched the, I think you talked about tearing Paris apart. And I watched that piece of London being torn apart, which I found completely thrilling. I thought it was so exciting to see these, what would they be, 1870s terrace 1880s terrace streets being removed and I had a very high four storey up vantage point and I suppose that sort of typical student time you know the reverie of gawping out of the window uh, not knowing really what to do with the fact that I was meant to be a sculpture student actually watching the city sort of be unmade very terribly slowly because the methods then were to stand on the top of the wall with a pickaxe and remove the wall underneath your feet. It's a fantastic skill and very scary, but evidently not for those that do it. Um, and then the thrill of watching this estate being built, whose components, of course, were much bigger and much beefier. This is the Haygate estate, which is now, I gather, 30 years later, maybe it will be knocked down or not, etc. So. I suppose the sort of pleasure of being here this evening is a, somehow attached to the innocence, or maybe it isn't innocence, but it's certainly a kind of lack of knowledge. I don't, these boys can't know that they just got disgust. Well, how many are we? 200 people. They got sort of famous, which of course is what they want. And there's a kind of connection to my um, indolence, I think. So when I was asked to do this project, I thought, how can I possibly get my kind of indolence into these pages in a way that I'll feel good about? And after a very short time, I, I realized that those places where you stand in the cement in the street, of course, you usually mistake for dog shit. You're so relieved when it's cement, um, are, can become completely hypnotic. And while I was doing this, I noticed that, in fact, there are two categories of standing in the cement. There's the one which says, I was here, which is the boys, uh, which, in fact, you don't find on the fast streets. You don't find, I was here, 
on intense inner city urban streets because everybody's moving too fast. You only find I was here where there's a certain kind of possible leisure or hanging out or whatever. But they're both marks and I became more and more interested to know which was which. And of course, in a funny sort of way, you don't really know. They're simply cast footprints of some passerby who went by. It doesn't necessarily say, um, it doesn't come with a name. So I, this isn't going to work, but my, my um, pages, in fact, some of them, just by sheer good chance, are even French occasions of the error of the misput foot on the street. But of course these are sort of war memorials in a way. They're kind of I managed to get across the road without dying. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. <clears throat> I'm uh, going to try and give the background to the, uh, the Diffusion ebook series, uh, which is also called Species of Spaces, uh, after Perek's eponymous book. I'm hoping that um, a number of people here will be familiar with Species of Spaces. It's a text that Perek was commissioned by Paul Virilio to write in, uh, I believe, 1973. It's a classification of spaces, um, or of space in and of itself. And as such, uh, it's something which has been in the back of my mind for many years, uh, kind of influences and has uh, affected the way I look at uh, many different aspects of my work. Um, we developed the downloadable ebook uh, series about three years ago now. Um, it form, fulfills a number of functions, uh, but essentially what we were looking for is a uh, an electronically distributable paper-based format um, and as such uh, there are some constructed examples at the front here and some unconstructed examples if people wish to take them away and experiment and play. It's partly about rethinking a notion of interactivity away from computers. It's also about uh, inculpating the, the reader into the process of the book production. But that's kind of uh, the background to the, to the, the books itself. One of the things I do is I run a, a research program called SOMA, or Social Matrices, which is uh, a partnership between Proboscis uh, and the Royal College of Art School of Communications, where I work, and also the media program at the London School of Economics. And we uh, have four basic research themes under which we run projects, one of which is called Species of Spaces. We're doing a number of projects under that theme, of which this diffusion ebook series is uh, the first to be completed. Uh, and the theme generally looks at uh, the different interactions that take place between the phenomenological world of the human senses and the ephemeral, ephemeral sorry, and uh, imminent world of data and communications. And I particularly, having created this uh, format, which is both a physical object, but is actually transmitted essentially uh, electronically, ephemerally, uh, I wanted to kind of start working in some of Perrick's ideas around classifications of space as a means to explore um, these kind of fundamental issues which we're looking at. So I asked four people, uh, William, Patrick, Brandon LaBelle, and Deborah Levy, who's uh, on a plane back from Australia at the moment, which is why she's not here, uh, to kind of be inspired by Perrick's book, Species of Spaces, and to update it slightly, so to speak, uh, to take in not just the, the kind of personal and the, the infraordinary of which Perrick speaks in his text, but also to uh, explore the kind of the new ramifications of the ephemeral world of uh, data and communications, how much we live our lives and are influenced by virtual communications, virtual data structures, which are also physical. They actually move through us. They uh, just are beyond our human senses. So it was also important in picking those four authors that each of them comes from a slightly different tradition. Brandon is a, a sound artist as well as a writer. Deborah is a playwright as well as a novelist. Patrick is an architect as well as a filmmaker. And William, as well as being a writer, is also an architect. 
And so it was about trying to place categorizations of spaces under many different orders and many different signs. Uh, and as such, I think we've, we've begun something which hopefully we will continue. Um, it's very much intended that uh, we will continue for the next couple of years commissioning more people from different backgrounds to contribute to this series, maybe each year with a slightly different focus. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to invite William to um, give us a few words, partly about his uh, approach to uh, writing the ebook and his relationship with Perec. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm also perhaps slightly an interloper here in that the, my article in the AA Files is, about, is not about Perec at all, but about W.G. Sebald. So perhaps I will bring a certain South German melancholic to this uh, Parisian uh, lightness. I wanted to be very brief and just to say uh, a couple of things about George Perret. Um, I think sometimes art, uh, writers, well, artists, well, get typecast. They put, get put in particular boxes and they're particular words which are associated with George Perret, which we have you know, constraint, word games, structure, so on. But what interests me in Georges Perec is what Ian has mentioned, that every project he did, he started again. He really thought out um, a completely different structure and a completely different way of working the book. And I find that really, really um, what inspires me about him. Right at the end of his life, I think one year or two years before he died, he wrote a list of things which he wanted to do before he died. I won't read them out without paraphrase. They're 37 things. Some of them were very ordinary things that you could just do anyway. He wanted to go on the boat on, on the, on the on say, Thames, on the Seine. He uh, wanted to throw out a whole load of things from his house because it was so crowded. He wanted to rearrange his uh, library. He wanted to give up smoking and so on. Then there were things which he thought would uh, reorganise his life in a, in a deeper way. He wanted to dress in a completely different way. He wanted to go and live in the countryside or he wanted to go and live for quite a long time in a, in a big city, for instance, London. There were things which he thought were, were dreams, which he wouldn't be able to do, which he wanted to do. He wanted to go to the exact intersection point of the equator and of the change of date line. He wanted to go into the polar circle. He wanted to have an experience outside town, outside time. He wanted to go in a submarine. He wanted to go in a balloon and so on. Uh, there were things he thought that it would be easy to do, but we should never get around to doing. He wanted to be able to solve the rubric cube. He wanted to learn to play the drums. He wanted to learn Italian, and he would quite like to be able to be able to paint. And then, uh, for someone who is a kind of well-regarded French writer, he wanted to write a book for kiddies, and he wanted to write a science fiction work. And it goes on all the way through. Most important, he wanted to plant a tree and to be able to watch it grow. And right at the end of two, he wanted the girl to get drunk with Malcolm Lowry, and he wanted to meet Vladimir Nabokov. And I just think that's a fantastic list for someone uh, at that stage of his life. He wanted to play the drums, he just didn't want to write. Thank you. Patrick? Thanks. <coughs> I, I wanted to, I'm coming at this, <coughs> coming at this as ever from the subject matter. Um, and I wanted to, to draw your attention or to, to punt two ideas and then um, allege that they might have something to do with one another. And the first one is that, um, or they might be connected. The first one is, is this interesting time lag, um, bet uh, which is partly why we're sitting here now and not 20 years ago, um, between um, three books, one of which is Perex Espèce d'Espace, uh, or species of spaces, which is why, which is what um, these interesting folded objects uh, connects them. And the other one, uh, the other two rather, are Lefebvre's The Production of Space. Now, sorry, uh, Pere Espèce d'Espace um, was published, I believe, in 1974 in France and in England in 1997, um, which is the most extreme, I think, of the lags. There are other lags which affect Perec, um, which are not so long. Now, Lefebvre's The Production of Space, I think, was written in 1974, but I might be wrong, because I haven't got it on me. But it was published here by Blackwell, interestingly enough, in 1991. Uh, and De Certo's 
um, the practice of everyday life, practice of everyday life, was written, I think, in 1974 and published in English in California in 1984. So that's actually quite quick. So that's the, sort of the exception. But there is this very interesting time lag. Um, and I don't know what it means, but it makes the 70s, it's one of these things that makes the 70s more interesting than we thought they were at the time. If indeed we didn't think they were interesting, I mean, I don't know whether we didn't think they weren't interesting, but I didn't think they were terribly interesting <laughs> until about the, the end of 1976, because I was interested in, you know, punk rock and stuff. Uh, and they did get interesting, um, but there was this kind of awful moment with, you know, the Hillman Avenger and everything, which wasn't, <laughs> things weren't going very well. But actually, in, in fact, in 90s, but these books were all published in that year, 74, you know, with all these dreadful records that people <laughs> play now. Um, I mean, the other thing, I won't go to, I don't, I don't want to get off the point too much, but Kraftwerk <laughs> figure in this, because I, I didn't notice them, and I always feel guilty that I didn't really listen to Kraftwerk because I was listening to something else, Velvet Underground or something. Anyway, that's one idea. And um, the, the, just to stay with the 70s, I, and again, it's nothing to do with why we're here, but Stan Douglas said something very interesting. The artist, Stan Douglas, Canadian artist, said something very interesting about the 70s a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago. Uh, he said that rather than being the dead zone between the emancipatory utopias of the 60s and the neoliberal fantasy, he didn't use the word fantasy, that's my word, of the 80s. In fact, the 70s was the decade in which the future in which we are now living was kind of stitched up while we were all looking the other way. And I think that's fascinating. I'm so good. And, and, and it, when you look at these books, um, and again, I think it's probably true of Deserto more than the other two, you look at these books, there is this consciousness that electronics matter in a way which I think by that time I'd forgotten. By 74, you know, 60s we were all on about computers, but by 74 you'd sort of forgotten because it, it, they weren't there yet and, you know, life hadn't changed very much. It just kind of gone off a bit. So that's one idea. Now the other idea is this distinction between two subjectivities and one subjectivity is the subjectivity of description, which I, I forgive me if I'm wrong, but seems to characterize a lot of what Perec is doing as distinct from the subjectivity of transformation, which is what the Surrealists, for instance, did. Um, and one tends, to, one tends to think of the, of the radical subjectivity of the Surrealists and the Situationists, whereby you kind of change something by looking at it in the right kind of innovated frame of mind, possibly with a camera in your back pocket, which you whip out at the moment of frisson. Uh, excuse me. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's to do with making the ordinary extraordinary. Whereas what's happening here is making the ordinary infraordinary, which is much more kind of, much less, you know, you don't kind of get tired so quickly with that. Um, uh, and in, in much more sympathetic in many ways, because of course making the extraordinary, ex you know, revolutionary subjectivity didn't really work. You know, it kind of, you know, you have to keep taking the tablets. It's not good. So the infraordinary seems to me to be much more where we are now. And if one, again, one can compare the, 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 photo the era of photogenie, which is the radical subjectivity, with the era of the digital, perhaps. Uh, and this is where it connects to this thing about the 70s. Uh, and the era of the flaneur, or the post-flaneur, or the quasi-flaneur, or the derive, which is kind of going out, with the era of the domestic which is, I mean, he goes out, but it, there's a sort of domesticity about Perrick's writing, which I find incredibly appealing. Um, now, um, so did they have anything, the, the question is, do these things have anything in com to do with each other? Is there, is there something about the technologies or the, the media with which we now live, which makes reality more attractive than it used to? Uh, in that in the old days, photographs and cinema, photography and cinema was more attractive than reality. Is there something about digital media that means that digital media are possibly, you know, they have their, whatever their qualities and their, and, their, and their enabling potential, do they make reality more attractive by contrast, not by transforming it, just, just leaving it there, just looking at it? Is it like what you were saying? Is it more interesting now that we don't have to worry about revolutionary transformation to, to the extent that we did in 19, 
whenever it was, before the 70s. Um, now that brings me to this film. Uh, the word domestic brings me to this film, which is really, uh, it's a bit of a cheat, but I think probably in the end we decided that maybe we should have a bit of entertainment. So actually I'm contradicting myself, um, because it is, it's, it's actually video, but it's a bit photographic. Uh, and the film uh, to which the e-book is both the pendant <coughs> and the context, so that the, the e-book, my e-book, is called the Robinson Institute, which is a sort of joke, um, in that it, it, it describes the, the connection between uh, a film I made quite a long time ago now called Robinson in Space and the film which no one's seen, but, well, actually quite a lot of people. Apologies if you've seen it already. Some people here have seen it already. We're only going to show the first 10 minutes. Uh, if you want to see the whole thing, it's on at LSE next Friday night at, I think, is it 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock, no. thank you. 6, not 6.30, not 5, 6 o'clock. Uh, and it's called The Dilapidated Dwelling. And the, the, the dilapidation, it, it, it comes out of, uh, I found myself about a few years ago using the word Orwellian rather a lot. And there's a, when you, once you start thinking about, what do you mean Orwellian? It's got something to do with dilapidation. And the difference between old space and new space and that domestic space is often rather dilapidated. Um, and um, apart from that, I think it's probably rather off the point, but let's, let's just, I'll just check that I haven't forgotten anything, and then we can run it. Um, well, if I have, I'll put it in later. Um, it, this is just the beginning of the film, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, another one of these fictional documentaries, so um, when it gets boring, we'll stop it. go up to go down, you see. You have to go back to go forward. You have to go back to go forward. And you have to go, you don't have to go, you can look up. <laughs> I don't know. We better go. I don't want to, I've seen it. I don't want to. I mean, I know it's been unfortunate. Hang on, I don't want to be in the picture. At the beginning of 1998, I returned to England on a ferry from Gothenburg. For 20 years, I'd lived and worked among the little known nomadic people of the Arctic, who devote much of their time to the construction of enormous houses made of snow that cost nothing and are frequently rebuilt. There had been a storm, and we'd been waiting outside the port for 36 hours. When we finally disembarked, I fell asleep on the bus and didn't wake up until it reached the other side of the city. I wandered about all day. I bought some books, then stood for a long time outside a music shop. My 20 years' salary had been paid into an investment fund, which was by then valued at more than half a million pounds. I went in and bought a Fender Stratocaster. It didn't seem at all expensive. It was late when I finally tracked down our organization's local representative. She took me home and the next day explained to me what it was that I'd been recalled to do. Our project is an attempt to anticipate the future.
Its next stage was an investigation of the predicament of the house in the United Kingdom. My colleague lives in Biker, a district rebuilt by the city council in the 1970s. Designed in cooperation with its residents by Ralph Erskine, the English architect of international reputation who has lived and worked in Sweden since the 1930s. The architects worked in a shop which became the housing manager's office. I had visited Biker in 1976 before it was complete. I wondered whether any more places like it had been created while I'd been away. My colleague told me that Erskine's practice was now involved with one of the consortia which had been shortlisted to build the Millennium Village at Greenwich in South London. I felt as if I was beginning a convalescence. One of the books I bought was by the philosopher Henri Lefebvre. The idea of a new life is at once realistic and illusory, and hence neither true nor false. A total revolution, material, economic, social, political, psychic, cultural, erotic, etc., seems to be in the offing, as though already imminent to the present. To change life, however, we must first change space. For 20 years, I'd never left the Arctic, but I'd experienced the development of the digital technologies with which I kept in contact with the outside world. I was surprised how little these had changed the appearance of the landscapes we were passing. My colleague had told me that though the United Kingdom is now one of the most electronicized and internationalized of the advanced economies, its houses are the oldest and most dilapidated in Western Europe. Forty years earlier, we'd imagined a very different transformation. The bouwers van vroegere culturen werkten ook niet. Het nuttige werk werd gedaan door slaven. In New Babylon wordt het werk ook gedaan door slaven. Dat zijn de machines, de robots, de elektronische breinen. De mens zoekt slechts creatief werk. Maar New Babylon berust op het creatief gebruik van de machine. De machine in de hand van de kunstenaar. New Babylon is antilogisch. De hele stad is één groot, immens, overdekt collectief te huis. New Babylon was the project of the artist Constant an early member of the Situationist International. In a newspaper, I noticed an image of the pyramids, illustrating an extract from a study which had just been published. This revealed that, in England and Wales, the rate at which dwellings are being replaced is now so low that, in theory, every house will have to last for 5,600 years. <laughs> New Babylon is a labyrinth, onuitputtelijk in variatie, a palace with thousand kamers. What does it mean to live in a culture which finds it so difficult to produce new domestic architecture? Among the papers of a conference at the Werkbund Academy in Darmstadt in 1992, I found an essay. <coughs> Architects have long been attacking the idea that architecture should be essentially stable, material, and anchored to a particular location in space. One of the main targets for those who would make architecture more dynamic is, of course, that bulwark of inertia and confinement, the outer casing of our dwelling place that we call a house which explains why, as early as 1914, the futurists put their main emphasis, at least in theory, on the complex places of transit. We are the men of big hotels, railway stations, immense roads, colossal ports, covered markets, brilliantly lit galleries. 
We are dissatisfied because we are no longer able to come up with a truly promising form of architecture in which we would like to live. We have become nomads, restlessly wandering about. Even if we are sedentary and our wanderings consist of flipping through the television channels, I decided to revisit Shandy Hall at Cotswold, where Lawrence Stern wrote Tristram Shandy. Much of that most influentially modern of narratives is set in the kitchen. It occurred to me that if dwelling is philosophically unfashionable, it's become so only comparatively recently. With this thought, a new interest in domesticity was awakened, and I began to think seriously about finding somewhere to settle down. A few days later, I was visiting a newly opened supermarket in Sheffield. I met someone I haven't seen since we were teenagers. We fell in love and that night eloped to the West Cumbrian coast. My lover had three children, and it was a condition of our living on the beach that the house should be unoccupied for a month in any year. We decided we should have to find something more permanent and a little bigger, and began to look for a house in which it would be easier to work. At a conference in China, I met a representative of a leading multinational chemical manufacturer who agreed to meet the expenses of a small research establishment. We bought a large Edwardian house on the outskirts of a provincial university city. I recalled some former colleagues from their various exiles. And with the children as assistants, we began work on the project. I set up an office overlooking the back garden and began to write. In the last few decades, domestic life has been transformed in many more or less electronic ways. Underemployment, telephone banking, computers, email, superstores and online shopping. Most of these things make it easier to be at home or more difficult to go out. There's a lot of talk about teleworking and the death of the office. It looks as if we're all going to be spending a lot of time at home, but increasingly the purchase and maintenance of a house is a consumer's nightmare. When I was young, I saw a film about Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion House. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a first and very crude paper model of a house designed for industrial reproduction. Its requirements must be that it should be proof against fire, flood, tornado, earthquake, electrical storms, and marauders. It must be proof against drudgery, that is, in it must be accessories with which a housewife can accomplish all her house cleaning within 15 minutes. House is delivered by a service station which makes a round hole in the ground into which goes septic and fuel tank. The maximum of the height of the house is immediately reached by this mast and from this point all the balance of the structure is hung. By the 1960s Buckminster Fuller was an international figure who influenced architects like Norman Foster, Cedric Price and Arthur is doubling every nine years. Change is the dominant fact of today. Arthur Graham thinks architects should stop making bigger and better boxes and get down to the real business of architecture today, which they think is survival. Archigram sees that the ideas and techniques we need for this survival are already in existence 
in the tremendous backlog of ideas and invention deriving from the military, aerospace, and electronics industries. <laughs> Why don't we demand from homes and offices and shops and towns and cities the standards of performance we expect from aeroplanes and rockets and cars and home appliances? If we can make a flying cinema that carries 150 people at 600 miles an hour, five miles high, why are we building offices We're going to, uh, that weigh thousands of tons and just half an hour stand around? So throw open uh, to a... A general What's discussion, needed but first, is a new architecture to stand uh, beside space capsules, computers, and throwaway packs of an atomic world. That, um, I've been thinking about uh, as each Since of them have been speaking. Since the 1930s, um, the cost of most Ian consumer goods has dropped dramatically. Uh, William have touched the cost on of building houses the kind of paradoxical doubled. nature of Perec. Um, and I'm I'd arranged here, to visit Michael Hall, who'd written uh, the report I'd read his, about on the train his project, weeks earlier. His two projects, Lear and uh, Asbestos. Suburbanisation of spaces. can very I'm much kind of seen as, as a result an interesting of tension that Perec creates, which I think is quite unique. The cost and I think it's partly that Perec the is both constrained by the price of housing has come down particular much, devices which he uses, but at the so same time he's that most uniquely unclassifiable of authors. And I'm, Whereas I'd like to sort of throw it open and ask each of them um, very kind of how they see Perec, uh, not just as a writer, but as somebody who contributed to very, very uh, profoundly now, to uh, radio, which is yet again another kind of ephemeral media in which to work. So we'll just go um, round the table. I'll, I'll start with Richard first. Changed very substantial uh, manufacturing uh, did you just make me more fraudulent? And brought the <laughs> price of many ma manufacturing goods relative <laughs> to other goods tumbling what down. That, whereas... <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? I, I was trying to... Uh, uh, what? <laughs> their price um, of love. Do you just remember what he said? I, I do, actually. Yeah, that's what he did go now. Why? I mean, I mean what, what, do you well, like, what, is, what for you is the kind of the key I thing about hasn't changed very uh, the much tension in hundreds of years between lots the constraints of manpower, he uses lots of the fact that he is there are machines to help the heaviest work, work the but they're all as Well, to, to be honest, control. I'm not that fussed about all this systematic approach. I mean, you know, one has to do that. But for me, that's not what's important. What's important? Why well, the need the, the for so much manpower? Is, is the answers just, in well, the materials yeah, that are used. What's important Hardly anything that arrives is on the building site is this, can be used is just this as it is. Materials have to be prepared. To be. And it's very, very marked. That's why, I, you know, that's why I, um, that's what I go for. Materials have to be moved thing many you times have before to they're out, finally used. When you look out the window, you don't have to wish it was another world anymore. Things have to be accurately uh, fitted. The subject is still the everyday, some skill as it was with the surrealist. A skillful with, hand and eye, this writing, a few simple tools. It's, it's much less... Leaving London, we much visited less, another supermarket. Um, anxiety I'd noticed about that supermarkets the now offer mortgages. Occurs because you can't make a piece of writing Here, about something without transforming the, the subject, obviously. But, above the shop. but the... the, the um, I wondered if the demand consumer-oriented like, companies the, might be about to take an interest in... The expectations in are much more realistic. I think that's what's so If computerised consumerism would yeah, ever lead to better cheaper better. housing. Probably, arguably. When I was young, you know, look, look, I used to draw an Le Paisan de Paris is, is all very well, but, you know, there's too much... Too much, uh, um, you know, one has to stay awake all night too often. <laughs> this is much better because it respects, it respects one's not just domestic space, but domestic experience. That's what's good. That's what I like. Okay. Ian? Um, well, to talk about Perec, but also about the Ulipo in more general terms, I think that um, we are not, uh, Perec wasn't, and I think we are not particularly obsessed with, with formalism as an end in itself. I mean, it's a, it's a way of getting results. And as I said earlier, it's a way, in a way of um, putting your subconsciousness, putting your acquired knowledge, what you think you know about the world and the way you think you can see the world through what you've learnt at school and what you've experienced in your life. It's a way of putting all that to sleep and to a certain degree and being able to see things in a new way. But in a way, seeing things maybe as they are a little bit more and, or as the way you now 
seem to see that they are, but as uh, you said earlier, without investing in any expensive drugs or... Or even cheap or, drugs. Or even cheap drugs. <laughs> or, Kodak. And <laughs> in a way which is very easy to stop afterwards, you know, and doesn't put you in hospital and doesn't necessarily shorten your existence. Um, no, I don't mean just drugs. I mean art. Yeah. You know, because it's sort of... Or, or the sacred, you know. It's, I was only kidding. All those things that, that sort of have crop up in, 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 earlier, in an earlier period. Sorry, Anna. Yeah, no, no, no. And um, it's a way, uh, I think a very satisfying way of actually, strangely enough, feeling much more in control of what you're doing and the way you're perceiving the world then it's possible if you go about creating things in, in a so-called free way. And what is a free way? A free way is very much uh, using what is considered to be normal now. Uh, that is to say, you have on, imposed on you constraints that you haven't in fact chosen at all, but, but it's the way that what is considered to be a normal way of going about producing what is considered to be art or literature now is. So you don't have a choice. If you, you, if you impose your own sort of formalism, your own sort of restrictions, you can, to a certain degree, li liberate uh, your own mind from what you've inherited. And I think Perec, who had an extremely difficult childhood, after all, his father was killed in the war and his mother was killed in Auschwitz, needed to find a way of reconciling um, the horror of what he went through um, and finding a way of talking about this in undramatic terms. And it's that way of holding on to reality, when in fact reality is horrific, which I think um, is Perec's greatest gift to, to writing and to art. I, I just know just a piece of information. I'm afraid I'm going to respond like a PhD student now. Um, I mean, I know Perec uh, gained the reputation in France of being kind of a, like a literary machine, and he was critics didn't like that very much about him. I mean, it, a good writer was a writer who had a style and could be identified as, as such. Uh, he was very proud of uh, being able to write in, in very different ways, of uh, starting a new project every, every time he started a book of a completely different nature. Uh, he would actually classify the, all the territories he, he said he was uh, working on at the same time, uh, Olympian, autobiographical, quotidian, and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, uh, he produced a, a list which was equivalent to the one William was just uh, reading a while ago, where he, he actually declared all the kind of books he wanted to write about. Uh, he wanted to write uh, songs, uh, children books, um, comics uh, to explore all kind of constraints he could, constraints of time, constraints of, la of language, uh, and so on. Um, I think he was very proud of that and didn't consider himself naturally a, a literary machine. Right. Yet to go a little from, uh, from what Ian says, I think the, partly these constraints are, are uh, help to to a writer. There's nothing worse than sitting at this awful white piece of paper or computer screen, and nothing is on there at all. And I think the clever thing about the constraints was that the book was partly written because he'd given himself uh, stepping stones or whatever between the the uh, pieces of the book that then enabled him to to write it um, at a slight angle. I think there's a there's a poem by Fitzgerald called Kublai Khan, and he described how he wrote the poem. He said the first bit of the poem just came to him in a dream, and he knew what, what it was. And the second verse, or one, another verse, he sat down at breakfast and he just wrote it, and it was a little bit more difficult than the dream, but not much. And the third verse, he had to fight for three weeks. He was scratching out the words and going backwards and forwards, and it was a, a, a terrible time. And then he had an idea, a little bit like the, the Metro poem, he said, the fourth verse, I'm not going to sit here anymore. Fourth verse, I'm just going to walk to the nearest village, and as I go, I'm going to have the fourth verse. 
and come back in and I'm going to write it down. It was an early metro poem. There wasn't a metro then. <laughs> and the curious thing is, I think nobody knows which verse is which. The poem is very inspired. But of all the, the four methods of writing, just having it in a dream or just writing it or battling it out or thinking of some constraint that will make you write it, they somehow came together to one poem. <laughs> Are you sure? Um, it's all been said, really, hasn't it? Um, constraints, yes, well, um, I suppose what's interesting is that he invented these constraints but then violated them, almost all of them. Um, sometimes, interestingly, he violated them systematically as well, uh, as in the case of Life Uses Manual, where there were sort of built in violations of, of various aspects of the constraint, or in the case of this project, where he just couldn't be bothered to go to various places. and. The important thing seems to be that the, 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 the grid, if you like, existed. I mean, if you think about it, what, what a grid is, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a mapping of space, it's a dividing of space into, into manageable portions. You know? In the way that in some of these texts, the, the space that he sees is manageable because, it's got, because the houses have got numbers on them. And so that space is already cut up for you before you start um, describing it. You know? um, it, it relates to what William was saying about blank pages as well, because in, in Species of Spaces, Beric says everything starts with the page, um, the blank space. And it is, it's, it's space rather than a space. And it's only when you start making a, a mark, any mark on that page, you start writing on it, and that space becomes vectorized from left to right. There's a left to right, there's a back, there's a front, there's an up and a down. And I feel that this is related to Beric's own relation to... to to, to his body, and sort of maybe sort of a problematic relation to the limits of his own body and the dimensions of his own body as well. Uh, that's it. I think there's a, another element to that, and I think what you say about Perrick violating his own rules is, is particularly interesting. Something immediately jumped to mind, which is Perrick's text. His, his possibly his most famous text is um, A Void, in, uh, as it's translated in, in English, or La Disparition, the, the text without a single E within it. But not so well known is another text he wrote as a kind of, uh, where I think he said he used up all of the E's which he had missed out in A Void. It's called, or it's translated in English as the Exeter text. And what's interesting in, in, in La Disparition, Perec really does use the French grammar and French language in quite rigid and strict ways. He doesn't bend language. Uh, beyond reasonability, but with the Exeter text, I mean, he just has fun, and he really does violate all his own rules. He makes up words. He he completely, it, it, to make a text in which the only vowel is an e, he completely uh, abandons all idea, all the kind of rules in which he set himself for a void. Ian translated that text. So. <laughs> you didn't know that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Uh, <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, in terms of, do you think that's a, in uh, terms of an interesting oh, yeah, way absolutely, to deal with absolutely. Um, a genre and style? In a sense, um, avoid uh, la disparition is, is was almost the idea being that you should, in fact, start reading the, the book not knowing what's going on and sort of work out what's going on because there are all sorts of hints being thrown around. Whereas the Rivenant, the Exeter text, it's so obvious right from the start that what's going on. And it just gets worse and worse as, as the book becomes increasingly pornographic. And it's a way, actually, of seeing how far you can go with a rule, how, how much you can break a rule and the rule still be there, in fact, I would say. Does any, would anybody like to ask the, any of the panel? Oh, stra hand straight up here. There's a mic just coming. Yeah, um, I kind of wanted to, to um, put a cat among the pigeons. I think you've been all too nice. Um, uh, and I, I get kind of nervous um, when Perrick is... I don't actually know anything about Perrick. I'll admit that. Nothing at all. I know a bit about Lefebvre, a bit about the Situationists, a bit about the Surrealists, and a bit about Baudrillard, the figure that hasn't been mentioned, but, um, and a bit about psychoanalysis. And certainly, you'd be very cautious of talking about reality in the way that you've been talking about reality if you engage with Lacanian psychoanalysis. I mean, talking about things as they really are, um, holding on to reality. Um, I guess I've always been skeptical of that sort of discourse of the everyday, which is so often 
in a kind of paradoxical way, co-opted by its opposite, i.e. by the kind of the spectacle itself, that it becomes aestheticized. Um, that as soon as you get kind of the everyday turning into kind of um, exhibitions in, in, in art galleries, as soon as you get straw bale houses supposedly sort of designed according to the everyday and appearing in glossy magazines, that, that whole discourse has kind of been shown to be slightly sort of problematic. And I wonder whether we, if we've been looking at sort of Perec today, we really shouldn't, um, um, shouldn't try and think about actually about a, a kind of a process that's gone on since the 60s and 70s. I want to pick up what Patrick Keeler was saying, which I thought was very interesting sort of observations about how he thought that somehow we'd shifted from this kind of gaze, this kind of revolutionary, aestheticizing, romanticizing, whatever it was, gaze of the surrealists and the situationists into one which was just simply kind of accepting the ordinary as it was to whether, in fact, one shouldn't actually sort of see what's happening today, and I'm thinking really kind of like a, of a world in which kind of we have reality TV, where people are kind of gazing at everyone's living rooms, just as you guys were gazing at some guys in a car outside. Whether you can't sort of see, situate that within a kind of a progress in a genealogy, um, which goes on from the society of the spectacle, through into what Baudrillard calls the next order, which is kind of hyper-reality, in which somehow now this world of the image has become a reality, into what may be a kind of a further order, in which somehow this kind of world of, of reality has become part of, of, of has been co-opted into the, into the world of television and so on. So, I mean, I think, I mean, you, you kind of present this picture as though Perrick somehow stands outside a sort of mediatized sort of existence, as though this gaze is innocent, as though one can somehow engage with reality, the ordinary, um, in a straightforward way. I, I don't think you can anymore, and I think that the, the cultural conditions is, have led us to a kind of a complete mediatization uh, of the world, um, uh, a kind of acute aestheticization in a certain sort of way. And I think that maybe therefore that, that, that whatever mm. Perrick was saying back in the 70s, 60s, where it was, needs to be kind of rethought in the conditions of, of, of kind of um, in which, uh, of, of reality TV in which things have come somehow been some strangely co-opted. Can I answer that at once? Um, well, I think, you know, what I was trying to say earlier is that and per we're talking about Perec in particular, but we can talk about Ulipian approaches in general. Um, what I was trying to say earlier is that uh, precisely by using what are apparently arbitrary constraints or, or procedures, forces the user to see things in a different way. So it's precisely a way of escaping from that kind of imposed vision of the world. Uh, which you're talking about, it seems to me, or, or a potential way out. Because when you, when you have to go about telling a story, for example, without using a particular letter of the alphabet, um, it forces you to think about what you're doing with language, what you're saying, from the letter upwards, from the letter to the word to the sentence. So it... You're, you're in a completely new way <coughs> of constructing a story because you can't any longer <coughs> have an idea and, you know, whip out the, the sentences after the sentences after the sentences and repeat again and again and again your way of seeing which has been imposed. You're absolutely right, by television, by media. I'm not saying you can ever escape from that at all. I mean, I was perhaps exaggerating earlier, but it's certainly gives you the chance to, to see things in a, in, a, in a new light, in a completely unexpected light sometimes. Patrick, do you Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, I, I take your point, actually, but I think, first of all, both, both options, if they are options, which they aren't, but both strategies are problematic. You know, they're more or less, but both pro more or less problematic, so it's not that one isn't problematic and one is problematic. Um, and the other thing, it, it frequently occurs to me that actually the difference between the two has got, quite possibly got something to do with the fact that I'm getting older. Um, but um, I think there is nonetheless um, a kind of value uh, in, well, I mean obviously there's a value, but I think there is nonetheless some connection. And, and I take also the thing about reality TV, because I think what I'm talking about isn't a dominant subjectivity. In other words, it's the alternative to television. I, I, I'm, you know, 
very cheered by the fact that fewer people seem to be watching television. You know, the television people are they're absolutely bloody desperate these days because no one wants the junk anymore. You know, people are very picky. Um, you know, ornithology is popular. Now, that could be immensely problematic for all sorts of reasons, but it, it is to do with a kind of... It, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intensification, actually, of um, uh, well, if we can't call it reality, I'll have to think of another word, but it, 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 it's, it's, um, it's, it's just looking harder. It's not looking in a different way, maybe. I don't know. I mean, this isn't, this isn't necessarily, I mean, certainly, it, 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 it's a very partial, it's my very partial reading of Perec, and it certainly isn't confined to Perec. And I think De Certo is also an example of this, this kind of difference, if you like. Um, uh, but but for, for, for me, I, I mean, you know, one can no longer really talk, it seems to be, of the revolution of everyday life. It's, well, you can talk about it, but it's, it's incredibly difficult to sustain that belief. But one can talk about, I mean, in, you know, almost ironically, the improvement of everyday life. I mean, I've just written... I, I always get into trouble with proofreaders about italics because I'm always putting these in italics and they will say, why is it in italics? And, and you, you put the improvement of everyday life, it's kind of, you know, it's a joke. You know, it's, it's, it's improvement in the absence of anything else. It is rather fatalistic, I grant you, yeah. But we, the, I mean, going back to this thing about the 70s, um, you know, there's no... The future has, seems to have disappeared from contemporary discourse to a very great extent. This is another thing Stan Douglas said. It's very difficult to find anyone talking about the future. And that's because the future is the one, the future they were talking about in the 70s, or the 60s even possibly, is the one we're now living in. You know, this is it. Yes. <laughs> you know, there we, we are, you know. So things have changed. And the question what we do about it, I don't know. You know that's another whole new bag, isn't it? That's, um, you know, roll on. Maybe we should talk about that. Brian? Um, I'm um, interested in uh, the uh, idea of constraint. Um, I take it that the reason that we're all in an architecture school discussing a writer is that we seem to have found a writer who, whose um, formal structures have not come from literature itself, like iambic hexameters, enjambments, caesuras, and sonnets, and so on, but has somehow uh, dealt with and um, dealt himself and then forced himself to deal with constraints which have some similarity to the regulations imposed upon us by walls and laws and regimes and schedules and routines, uh, which are exactly the structures of a city. Now, um, and, and, and amidst those, in, in the gaps between those walls and laws and schedules, um, he seems to describe uh, an, uh, an infranormal, a, a state of, um, a, of a present tense description in some kind of way, in which subjectivity can negotiate itself only by setting its own terms. Um, but I, I'm... I'm interested as to exactly how an architect um, might be learning from this, because the project in Santiago that you described, I'm not sure whether you don't run the risk of another formalization, where in some sense the arbitrary limits that uh, Perec has dealt himself, you're somehow feeding back into the production of the rules which architects themselves produce, i.e. walls and streets. Now, um, I, I don't know, I've got no final term in this kind of set of reflections, but I am thinking of something like a life lived in, let's say, a grid, where you only proceeded along the decumanus and you always left out the other axis, or you only lived within certain streets. Um, certainly, I mean, architecture is nothing but the negotiation of principles. Uh, I, I wrote uh, an essay once in a, a collection which was entitled Are There Any 
remaining principles of architecture? And I answered, well, architecture is nothing but the pr production of principles. And um, it, it seems to me that there's some sort of negotiation between what is, is imposed, what we impose, and what is left in between those two impositions that seems to be the subject here. Um, I think two, two answers to, to the question. I, the first, I, I guess, uh, sorry. I, I'll provide two answers. I, I guess the first should be answered by Ian, but I'll, I'll run the risk of completing something on behalf of the Ulipo. I, as far as, I, as I'm concerned, the Ulipo has uh, the... There are two projects for the Ulipo. One, to kind of excavate all constraints which have not been used for, for a while. I mean, the sonnet being one of them, uh, the, the sestim, and so on. Um, and to, I mean, to... to bring a new lease of life for those constraints, plus, uh, on the other hand, uh, invent new constraints. And when the constraint is invented, the, the rule, more or less, uh, says that uh, there should be an example to illustrate the constraints. Am I right, Ian? It's fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So that, for the first part, I mean, Ulipo is concerned with uh, historical constraints as much as with uh, the coining, the, new, the, the devising of new constraints. Um, we, we could say Perec uh, worked mainly with the uh, new constraints, not only produced by him, but some, but some of the mathematicians of the Ulipo. The uh, lipogram being, uh, of yeah. course, an extremely old constraint, yeah. going back to the ancient Greeks. True, but he, he was actually one, the one who provided like, the archaeology of, the, of the, the history of the lipogram mm. in order to reuse it. So it, it's an old constraint, but in a way he kind of gave a, a new lease of life to it. The second question concerning what the work we do, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because uh, I haven't got anything to show. Uh, but I, I mean, it's either, perhaps the only thing I can say uh, is that a constraint doesn't mean uh, a rule you have to follow. You invent the constraints as much as you need them and you discard them when they're not useful. So a constraint doesn't mean a cosmology you have to obey because ultimately it doesn't become a layer of meaning of the work. It doesn't uh, underlie the work. It's just a helpful tool to produce a work. Therefore, you can use a constraint in any way you, you want. And of course, there could be a, a risk of becoming in increasingly formalized. But you can also use constraints to, to program a project, to locate activities. You can, a constraint is, is actually under your control. Raymond Quenot used to say the, the inspired poet uh, is never inspired because he's always inspired, meaning that the inspiration didn't come from the muses, but he had the control of the, of the muses because the inspiration relied on the devising of his own, of his own constraints. So yes, it could become uh, extremely formalized if it is followed uh, like a rule of the game, which is uh, extremely tyrannic, but you can always force the, the, the constraints in the way you like according to the things you're doing. Is there a question just in the second row? I wonder if um, Perec doesn't have an approach which is very much uh, a child's approach to reality. Um, a child has to invent a learning process <coughs> to deal with reality, which is full of constraints and hurdles, limitations. And um, for a child um, who has this dream of being omnipotent, uh, the fact that he can create his constraints is very satisfying instead of having them imposed on him as it's always the case. So there is a kind of compensation um, in the fact that you create your grid, your limitations yourselves. It's a way to state your freedom and to, to appropriate reality from coming from yourselves. Um, so that seems very basic and, and primitive, but that may be a, a component which is very much, um, which one does find very often uh, with artists. I have to
to admit I identified with what you said. <laughs> yep. Um, well, I think the, the, the space in which the artist operates is, is, is an in-between space. I mean, if you, I mean, you, you've evoked um, children's desires and, and children's playing activities. You think of Winnicott, for example, uh, in playing in reality. You know? and it's a negotiation between an inner world, which is, which is where omnipotence reigns, and an outer world, which is unpredictable, dangerous, uh, and in the ha perceived to be in the hands of other people. The whole point about artistic activity, creativity, is that it takes place in a space which is in between. And I think Beric was, was always trying to, to define the, the boundaries of that in between, and, and they shift. You know? There's a question right at the back down there. <laughs> Yeah, um, can people hear me? Just, just talk into it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a sense in which I wanted to sort of um, possibly complicate this apparent naivety uh, that, that Perich has when he, when he looks towards the world or that people seem to be picking up on when he looks towards the world. Um, there's a sense in which the the E in the void sort of corresponds to um, the letter in, in Poe's purloined letter. And of course, Parrish was very interested in detective fiction. Um, and of course, the purloined letter had a, a great resonance for uh, Lacan, who used it in his, his seminar. So I think there's a sense in which um, Parrish has already made the move towards Lacan. Um, Freud is one of the authors that the constraints in Life of User's Manual, it, he's one of the authors that's always invoked. Um, there's a section in Life of User's Manual where uh, Madame Marcier, who's the owner of an antique shop, uh, moves around the, uh, the antiques in the shop between the front of the shop, the back of the shop, her bedroom, her living space. And uh, that seems to be a very simple sort of clear way in which objects get moved from one place to another. But Perich actually produces the schema of this, and it is actually basically a Kleinian diagram or a, or a Lacanian schema L or something like that. So I think, well, a Kleinian diagram, I can see people <laughs> shaking their head. All no, right. He got it from Levi Strauss, actually. It's, oh, uh, it's well, a kinship I, I, diagram. Yeah, okay, yes. but uh, we could. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. But I mean, there, there is a sense in which this sort of very simple sense is, you know, the very simple movement of these objects around, around the apartment is already incredibly complicated for him. And I think what people are picking up on when they talk about his naivety and the, the clarity, with, which is apparent, is, is actually Parrish's skill as a writer. Um, because Life of User's Manual won the prize, which was basically a prize given, I think, for generally speaking, for realist novels, and people didn't actually realise the constraint that, that went on beneath it. I just wonder whether, you know, whether that rings any bells with, with people on the panel that, who, who can already see this complexity before this apparent presentation of the, of the simple. The, yeah, I mean, if I could take that, um, Ian's probably got something to say as well about this. Uh, I mean, you know the advert for, for Ron Seal, you know, it does exactly what it says on the can. Uh, I mean, Perex books is kind of the reverse of that. I mean, they do almost the opposite of what they say on the covers. Um, you take a description, we've referred to uh, species of spaces quite a lot tonight, but there's a description in there of a room um, that Perex stayed in as a child in Rock in, in Cornwall. And this appears to be a fairly straightforward description. He says, you know, I've got a very clear memory. I can remember every room I've ever slept in. You were only there, there was a table on the left-hand side, the bed was there, the window was there, the wash basin was there. And then he goes on about something else, then he says, yes, all I have to do is lie down on my bed, close my eyes, and I can still feel now the door handle was here, and blah, blah, blah. And what nobody, I think, has noticed about that text is, in fact, he inverts the room completely, the laterality of the room, left, right, is inverted the second time round. And you appear to be getting the same thing twice, but you're not, you're getting the same thing seen, you're getting the same thing seen, but seen in a mirror this time. And Perec's texts are like uh, trompe l'oeil photographs. I mean, they're, they're, there's always more going on there. And it's the case with these texts as well. We, we've, we've kind of pushed the reality aspect of it, if you like. Um, but it, it, he problematizes that relationship more than take, yeah, 
I don't think we, we, we should assume Perec's naivety uh, uh, in terms of the real. Yeah. I was just going to say about uh, your specific points about life uses manual. Um, there's kind of uh, two ways, as I was saying earlier, of well, two ways, at least two ways, umpteen ways, of thinking about formal structures and their relationship between what you, well, in the case of literature, what you read. And Life of User's Manual is a, is a case in point where um, there is a, an extremely complex formal structure underlying the whole thing, but there is absolutely no need for the reader to, to know what's going on at all. Um, and in fact, we, I, I don't think we, even correct specialists, uh, who's, who've spent their entire life digging around in, in, in this book, have found everything that's going on. Uh, maybe they never will. Another, um, well, I can think of two, at least two or three more examples of highly complex novels written by members of the group where the author has chosen not to reveal the underlying structures for the very simple reason he wants uh, you, us, to read the books as novels and not as um, sort of crossword puzzles, you know. He, he doesn't want you to be there with this sort of uh, list of things that are going on in one hand and the novel in the other hand saying, oh yes, well, this is what he did here and this is how he did this. He wants you to read the book as a book. Um, so that's why when we, when we talk about formal structures, we're not necessarily talking about things that we want you even to know about, in fact. It's not necessarily necessary. In the case of uh, Avoid, it is, because the structure is the point of the book. It's, but then that's, a, that's something else, to go, to go back to that. Don't forget, well, perhaps you don't know, in French, uh, the letter E is pronounced E, uh, which is a pun on them, which is pronounced E uh, as well, E-U-X. And in his autobiographical book, W, the dedication is pour eux, for them, for his parents who have disappeared. So that is also the, the autobiographical aspect of a void of la disparition. It's, it's also about the disappearance of them. It's a dis, the disappearance of the letter E, them, his parents. And how can he continue writing? How can he write without that communist letter of all and without that communist thing of all, which is normally to have parents that you knew. So just to, to give you two different ways of that Perec and that we in general, you Lippians, go about using formal structures. We've been given the, uh, the signal now that we need to wrap up, so. So I'd like to, well, thank all the panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Very I just disappeared, I think. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Thank you.